This is Dolio, an original thriller fiction podcast presented in serialized format, a chapter at a time, written by Jared Canton, narrated by Joshua Canton, a Steady Chaos production. Previously on Dolio. He leaned forward, angled his smartphone screen in my direction. I leaned in. The small screen flickered to life. Unsteadily, the video's target wandered to the dark ground, then up, and around in a wide sweeping scope of the surroundings. Humans, some donning comic-related apparel, others in actual costumes, came into focus with terror-filled eyes. Some screamed in horror, as cell phone screens illuminated a small circle of humans. Ross dragged his finger along a thin red line at the bottom of the video, centering a red dot within the line. My favorite part, he said. I saw a man, bloodied on the ground, dressed like Dolio. He looked dazed, confused, on his knees. He leaned back unsurely, placed his, no my, hands to his goggles, and lifted. Saw myself swipe a gloved hand under the goggles lens, wipe blood from my nose and mouth, then replace the mask. I remembered the ringing in my head, my battle to regain consciousness vaguely, then the encouragement of kind strangers. Ross paused the video, and pulled the bar back a few notches, sending the video reeling in reverse. He paused it with maximum dolio facial exposure, stretched his fingers to expand the image. That guy look familiar to you? I shook my head slowly, lying. There was a vague resemblance. Not nearly enough to get there on the image alone, but certainly enough to corroborate if you'd already made up your mind. Hmm, he moaned ominously, swiped again, and the video shifted to another, that of a newscast. Gang violence broke out in these dangerous city streets last night around 3 a.m. Three members of a gang that call themselves the Blood Struggles were killed. Officers arrived on the scene to find one dead, fallen from the very rooftop behind me. An officer was also shot and wounded. He is, thankfully, in stable condition. I spoke with a second officer this morning. He experienced minor injuries, and he shed some light on the real story of what happened here last night. The officer, who wished to remain unnamed, as well as several other unnamed witnesses, confirmed the presence of a masked vigilante at the scene. The vigilante, who is rumored to call himself Dolio, is not only suspected in the killings of the three gang members last night, but also in the assault of an officer, as well as another fatal encounter earlier this month. Here is a sketch of the vigilante. If you see him, call your local police department. He is presumed armed and very dangerous. He deadened the image with a button press and set the phone back down. Do you believe me now? The smugness I had reserved for this moment oozed from my pores. I believe that there is in fact a vigilante. Good, I said. Just know I won't rest until I find out who he is. Episode 22. Gang Related. I never liked hospitals. The white walls, fluorescent lights, stainless steel, tile floors, all beg the question, did they treat sick people here, or cook them? This hospital, no different, presented itself like an industrial kitchen. I had entered at the west wing nearest emergency, and upon passing through the second set of sliding automatic doors, the overcrowded waiting room came into view in audible range. There were old people and young people, black, brown and white, toddlers and infants, all with one thing in common, a frustrated, miserable, <laughs> impatient look on their faces. I moved past the waiting room to the front desk, when suddenly, the rattle of wheels on tile and sounds associated with urgency prompted me to attention. We need help over here! A young man yelled. When I redirected my attention to the commotion, I saw a swollen, bloodied face. A young black man, no older than twenty, thin, laid along a stretcher, with two EMTs pushing him into the lobby. Clear out! The first EMT yelled in my direction as he swatted his free hand to the side in a repeated fervent motion. I complied, taking a full step back as the scene whirred past me. It was then that the mangled face on the table triggered a memory, a solitary flash of recognition and familiarity. The EMTs parked the stretcher at the front desk. Paging Dr. Allen to emergency? Dr. Allen to emergency! A woman's voice crackled, then barked over the loudspeaker. I strolled nearer the stretcher, peered in for a closer look. 
Can I help you, sir? The larger EMT asked. His name tag identified him as Drew. What's this young man's name? Sir, we can't give you that information. But you can. The other EMT glanced at me, then returned his hand to an oxygen mask over the boy's face. His brow curled up in pure annoyance, distorting an otherwise young and pleasant face. Sir, please. My name is Ryder Daniels. I'm a Boston City prosecutor. If this is what it looks like, you know I'll get the name sooner or later. You have ID. I flipped the sad plastic looking badge thing. No different than the ones that humans in factories, office buildings, and college campuses use. We didn't get his name, Drew said. Do you have any other information? Where'd he come from? How did this happen? Do we have a room yet? We need a doctor. He spoke intentionally louder than needed for the receptionist's benefit, and she took the hint. Any available doctor to emergency, please. Any available doctor. Her cheeks flushed and she went back to reading her Cosmo, before looking back up. Just room him, she said, flipping a dismissive backhand towards the doors to her right. What happened? I asked again. Appears gang-related. Drew sauntered over to the stretcher and pulled down the boy's shirt collar. The word snitch had been carved into his upper left pectoral muscle, and just above that, I found my connection. I swallowed hard. I had done it again, intervened, and damned another victim to face an enemy they were no match for. The boy lying on the table was Latrell, and the reason he was lying there was because of what I had done nights before. I had threatened Rodney, and he must have connected the dots, assumed that my attack was retaliatory for something. Rodney's most recent deed that would warrant the type of retaliation I had employed was likely the killing of Latrell's brother. The connections were obvious. Is he going to be okay? We think so. He's stable. But man, he may never get over an attack like this, Drew said, angling to pivot the stretcher to the rear door. Latrell's head slowly drooped to the side. His eyes, swollen, puffy, red, met mine through slits. His hand climbed to his face, grabbed the oxygen mask, and slid it from his mouth over to his cheek. I stepped in closer. Wait, I instructed the EMTs. What did you do? Latrell asked but it was more accusation. I said nothing. Doing so was not easy. They said I snitched, that I had some whack job track them down. Right after he delivered the sentence, he took a long, laborious breath of air. <sighs> Who's they? They coming. We have to go. That's enough, Drew said. He needs to- Two swinging doors flew open and Kinsley burst through like a woman on fire. She slung a coy smile my way didn't say a word to me, and dove straight into caring for Latrell. It was fascinating watching her work, watching her apply a lifetime of learning to a wounded boy, scared, alone. She spoke soothingly to him the whole time, pausing only momentarily to shout instructions to the EMTs. Let's go, she instructed to the EMT, and with that, without another glance in my direction, she was gone, and I waited, lost in treacherous thought. I waited a long time, didn't know if she wanted me to call, reschedule, or just keep my trivial pursuits out of the way of her very important day job. So I did what any confused, smitten coward would. I texted her. To my surprise, within minutes, she texted back the floor and office number of a meeting location. I waited in that office another 30 minutes, but when she finally arrived, she flung a sidelong glance that screamed trouble. How were the stitches? She gestured towards an examination table and closed the door behind us. I think I might have slipped them last night. I showed her a lightly bloodied shirt sleeve. I saw a comic convention video on YouTube. I'm not surprised. She fiddled with a cabinet, pulled out some thread, and immediately got back to work. It's always easier when you have the right tools. Her words a direct attack on the shoddy supplies Dad had made available in my Dolio medical facility. As she tied the final knot, I noticed a certain something missing on her ring finger. My stomach danced at an array of possible reasons. Where's the rock? I was hoping she had given it back, realized there was more out there, more for her to see and experience and live. Oh, damn. She patted her pockets feverishly. I always take it off during triage. She finally identified the ring in her breast pocket and slid it onto the vacancy on her left finger. The deep, Firmly outlined indent nearest her lowest knuckle suggested she had been engaged for a long time. A very long time. 
How long have you been engaged, exactly? Four years next month. Don't go rushing into things. You knew that boy? She alleged, changing the subject hastily. Yes, I know that boy. How? His brother was killed. He witnessed the whole thing. Who did it? The same gang that gave me this. I gestured to the stab wound in my shoulder. So he's why you went after that Germain character. He is. The boy. Latrell is it? I nodded. Was he going to testify? No, and I don't blame him. We couldn't protect him. Apparently I still can't. He's going to be fine. Fine might not be the best word. The injuries aren't life-threatening, is what I meant. Emotionally, attacks, trauma, it's hard to get over. Hard to predict his recovery in that regard. That advice from personal experience? I dropped my finger to the inner part of her wrist and dragged it up her forearm, clearing it of her sleeve until the scar I had seen the first time we had met came fully into view. She pulled her arm away, said nothing. How'd you get that? Long story. Tell me over dinner. Not a good idea. She stepped on the suggestion as if it were a wandering roach skittering across her kitchen linoleum floor. We sat in awkward silence a moment. It can't be like this every time we see each other. I'm getting married and there's nothing that's going to change that. Look, I'm flattered. You're a charming, attractive guy. You have big ideals, but I'm spoken for, and no heroic act or witty quip is going to change that. She stood now, backed away from me a step. Understood, I said, absorbing the razor-sharp eagle blow. I enjoy your company, but in the friends or sidekick hero interaction kind of way. Nothing more. She winked, appeared to now embrace the sidekick designation. It was the first indication she was willing to continue as my midnight health professional. Sidekick may be a bit of a stretch. Assistant, perhaps? I challenged. Would you prefer to go it alone? Sidekick it is, I quickly caved. So you agree to keep treating me? Under a few conditions. First, tell me before you go play hero, so I can plan around your dizzying schedule. Agreed. Secondly, never, ever, ever admit that I am involved. I don't care if someone walks in and sees me stitching up a bullet hole with you in full hero regalia. I'm not involved. I'd never intentionally put your career at risk. She nodded as I said it, appeared to believe me. Lastly, I need to know when this ends. I need to know that you have a plan, that once you stop this problem, you won't just create another. I can't do this forever, but I won't make you do it alone. Just tell me at some point. It stops. My immediate plan is to make sure Latrell is safe. I owe him that. And to do that, I have to get Rodney. And how do you plan to get Rodney? I imagine I just let him find me, because he's already looking. The curtain curled sharply around the hospital bed, fashioning a cocoon of falsely implied privacy. It hung heavily from a steel track, separating the bed from a second vacant bed in the room. I pushed it aside, revealing Latrell, still and bruised. Wires invaded his body in a manner that made him look more like a complex electrical circuit than man. His face was bloated, as if inflated with a basketball pump. Surprisingly, just several hours after his admittance, I was allowed to speak with him. I grabbed the chair from the corner of the room and dragged it to Latrell's bedside. The chair's steel legs made a screechy squeal as they slid. I'm sorry, he said. What? I asked, caught off guard. For what could he possibly be apologizing? His eyes opened just a hint, as if keeping them open was exhausting. He slowly shook his head. It was you. I wasn't certain if it was a question or not, if he knew or wanted to know. I didn't deny or confirm his statement. That doesn't matter, I said. It matters, he paused. Water. I grabbed the small glass from the stand in the corner, dribbled the contents into the boy's dry, cracked lips. It matters to me, and it would have mattered to my brother. At that moment, I was reminded how far I had fallen from the ideals my job had once instilled. Ideals I once cherished, of right and wrong. Had I become exactly like those I was trying to stop, was I nothing more than vengeance, a mere retribution dealer? When I had backed myself into this corner... When my lie had led me to Dolio, I had hoped to be more. Now I wondered, had I gone too far? Or had I gone not far enough? Was I just a criminal with a different class of victim? A class of victim that I alone deemed expendable, worthy of punishment? Or was I a necessary substitute for a failing system? 
I had long believed that ten criminals free was better than one incarcerated or put to death for a crime that he or she didn't commit. And despite this, I had killed for mere association, for just being a blood struggle, nothing more. Was Dolio a new, evolving problem? Just a gang of one? Why did you want to see me? When they did this, to me, they wouldn't take no. Luttrell's tough guy mantra from days earlier had faded. His mannerisms, persona and aggression had abandoned him, leaving a scared kid alone in a hospital. They wouldn't take no? He held up his hand, now devoid of one pinky finger. Man, I only told one person about Jermaine and Rodney, and you know who that was. I nodded. So Rodney tells me Jermaine got killed by some guy dressed up in black. Some assassin. And that's the same assassin looking for Rodney. He nodded towards the water again, and I complied. Rodney says, only thing him and Jermaine have in common is they both use my brother for target practice. Luttrell's eyes welled up. He swallowed hard. So you see, they know I had something to do with it. They know I said something to someone. The hunter was becoming the hunted. I could feel the invisible gaze of the blood struggles on my back. They coming for you. I gave you up. Luttrell was crying. Stubborn tears freed themselves of his eyes and crested over his swollen cheeks. They buried themselves into the pillow behind his ears. My mind instantly went to Dad, alone at the condo. I don't blame you. I can take care of myself. They gonna kill you and anyone close to you. Just leave, man. Go far away. When will they come? I don't know. Now? Tomorrow? Next week? Latrell lifted his head as high off the pillow as he could manage, lowered his voice. There's an old warehouse a few blocks west of the H-Block apartments. My brother told me the heads of the struggles used to meet there to organize hits. You know? Important stuff. Important stuff like me? Yeah. Like you. I'm going to get some officers stationed here, just in case they come looking for you. I stood as I said it, kicked back the chair, and it skittered along the tile. They're not looking for me, he said. I assure you, they shouldn't be looking for me either, I said as I ran out the hospital room. Dad. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed Dolio, please come back for future episodes arriving at regular intervals, and subscribe and rate us on your favorite podcast application.